Over the past two decades, his work has been shown in innumerable exhibitions from the Tate Modern to mailboxes everywhere and in his own backyard. Uh, and Conrad makes carved and painted sculptures of everyday objects. And when you reach the gallery tonight, if it's not white, it's not white wall or white fixture or white lamps, it's carved wood and painted. Uh, so everything in that gallery, uh, including tables, uh, is carved and painted wood. Uh, and of course, you'll see a large number of carved and painted books. Uh, and I've come to feel uh, about those books. Um, when you're working with the exhibition, unpacking them with my student assistants, that, uh, that they're sort of like portraits of old friends. So Conrad's here tonight to talk to you about his, his process and uh, what this exhibition is about, and let's give him a big hand of uh, welcome. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, um, University of Tennessee Chattanooga, Chattanooga the city too, and the Crest Gallery, the Diane Merrick Visiting Art Series, um, and for all of you who are um, bringing me in and who I'll meet in the next few days. I'm looking forward to these interactions, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. Uh, there are three parts to this presentation. The first part is a, kind of an outline of a theoretical framework that supports my practice. Uh, not because theory is the most important thing or even the most interesting thing, but because it's useful for contextualizing the way that I think and work in my studio from research to practice. The second part will be a quick survey of a wide range of my projects that I've um, produced over the past years, followed by a closer examination by, of a dozen or so um, specific projects. And if there's questions along the way, uh, feel free to shout them out, interrupt me, um, that's totally fine, and I will uh, try and answer them as we go. Otherwise, there'll be time at the end, I think, for some questions, too. I've been using the faux corporate identification of untitled projects for almost 20 years now as a subtle distancing strategy and as a simple cataloging method that's allowed me to produce a large series of different but interrelated projects. This might make it sound like I had this all figured out from the beginning, but really, at the time, I was making it up as I went along. And it wasn't until I was working on the Untitled Mail Order Catalog project that I realized that I needed a parent company, um, someone to send out this catalog. And the simplest solution was to extend the company name um, from the name of the catalog, and so Untitled Projects became the company, the entity that sent out Untitled Mail Order Catalog. The other advantage of this kind of naming strategy is the way that Untitled reiterates the object it references by refusing to provide content. So it doesn't give you the content in the title, it forces a second look. I describe my Untitled Projects as sculptures that are fake versions of real things, intentionally constructed by hand out of wood and paint, and designed to move somewhat awkwardly through a given economic system, bumping and denting a trail, revealing a trajectory that begins to make tangible the processes of production, distribution, and exchange that surround the things in the world. One of the inherent strategies of this work is to create an anomaly, a strange thing that gives pause, a question of what is that? that is allowed to grow, fester, and eventually challenge the numbness of alienation that accompanies our culture of consumption. I want the viewer to pay attention to the interruptions, even those that are momentary, as glimmers of something different than the irresistible forces of neoliberal late capital. This might still be a little abstract, so let me break it down further. Um, I deliberately orient my artwork as things, as gatherings, as networks of relations directly concerned with issues of representation. And by representation, I mean the simulation of things. Labor, um, or the making of things. Economies, um, or the relations of things. And I'll kind of go into this, these categories a little bit. In my studio work, I'm interested in representational strategies, representation in the traditional sense of making sculptures that represent other things in the world, 
These sculptures are simulations, stand-ins, props, or surrogates that use basic tricks of illusion to fool the eye. Um, not all of this is my work, just, of course. This, this is illustrations to the point. We make artificial versions of real things for many reasons. Promotion, camouflage, control, substitution, or trickery. One of the more interesting uses for representation is, it, it's, is its capacity for generating an understanding of the real thing. I've come to believe that we do not get closer to the real if we make the artifice more believable, though perhaps we can get a better understanding of the real when we become acutely aware of the distance between the constructed artifice and us and the real. This is a moment of doubling that is inherent in our consciousness when we're able to see what we're seeing as well as see ourselves seeing, a reflection. These are actually paper funerary items that um, um, in China they're um, sold and used to be burnt um, uh, as kind of funerary offerings. And they come in every conceive conceivable object that you can think of as like some can be burnt and is made out of paper and burnt, sold and burnt. Um, I use this as an example too. This is a number of years ago. There was a crustacean that was discovered in the in the middle uh, at the bottom of the ocean, and uh, one of the first reactions to this object as it became sort of viral in its own way. Um, was to make uh, a plush version of this creature. And, um, and then also instructions about how to make your own plush version of this creature. And, and I think this is a real attempt to connect to those things that you can't understand or can't grasp or can't hold. Um, and it happens quite often in, in internet <laughs> culture. As I've mentioned, the objects I produce are carved out of wood and painted with oil paint. They're rather crude versions of the real thing, and they're designed to fall apart visually the closer we get to them, the way that paint in a still life is both paint and part of the representation. One might say that the life of these things as things begins at the very moment that they fall apart and reveal themselves. I'm also interested in representation that utilizes repetition. Repetition occurs when these sculptures go beyond just looking like their real counterparts, but also occupying time, space, and habits of the original referent. They extend the double take into a meditation of the thing and its relations. The second category, labor. Um, or handwork. I make objects by hand using tools as, as a deliberate strategy to draw attention to the specificity of labor so that my work, my labor, my time, my investment becomes foregrounded. I believe that hand production generates a visible identification that forces an attention to the act of construction. The handmade thing reveals the body that made it, but it also starts to point to the body that's viewing it drawing attention to adjacent acts of production that are simultaneously occurring. The production of space, the production of capital, the production of affect, etc. In other words, the facture of a thing, the relevatory madeness of a thing, has a strange capacity to reveal the political and social economies of both the space in which it's situated and the participants and things therein. Uh, the theorist Elizabeth Gross talks about um, this a little bit in her book, Time Travels, she writes, we actively produce, make objects in the world, and in doing so, we make the world amenable to our actions. This is a thing that we do to control the world, but also render ourselves vulnerable to their reactions. And this is an important part of labor and making that, I, that I'm really interested in, is how the thing that we make turns against us, or our agency is, is um, compromised um, in the generation of agency of the thing. Okay, and the last category is economies, um, or things in motion. Um, Arjuna Paterai in The Social Life of Things writes that we have to follow the things themselves for their meanings are inscribed in their forms, their uses, their trajectories. In my studio practice, I want to make artworks that are things in motion, 
things that reveal their stories, their connections, their network of relations, their politics. In part, this is a strategy to shift the conversation from the, from the ontological status of the object on this, um, the inert modernist object on the pedestal or a sculpture to interesting and more, perhaps more relevant questions of power, position, and privilege. Um, a lot of these images function almost like a sketchbook or kind of note-taking for me as I collect things as images are phenomenon. Um, and like, this is two shots of two different monitors on the sidewalks in New York City. One on the curb has a sort of habit of being um, available if you want to grab it. And then uh, the one in closer to the building, tucked away, it says it's reserved or it's not available. or uh, the trash as designated different from the possibly reusable flower pot. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is the in Chicago. Uh, if you dig out your parking spot in the winter when there's snow, um, if you build an interesting sculpture in place of in that empty space, and if it's good enough, if it's aesthetically pleasing enough as complicated enough, um, you can have that spot back, back when you return at the end of your workday. Um, if it's not good enough, if it looks too flimsy or if someone um, feels like they can uh, take it over, um, then you won't have your spot. And so it, this is a, an interesting way of how much do you need to occupy a space. Um, in the end, I believe that artworks as things are physically political in their very production and occupation of space, in their participation in the distribution, exchange, consumption, and the accumulations of various forms of capital. And I believe that things can be politically productive when they become platforms around which we gather and debate, when they empower those who are there near, but also when they generate frictions, when they frustrate, when they turn against us, and when they resist. Ultimately, I'm interested in this resistance. We live in a world and in a time of late capitalism that is global, dominant, and pervasive, and most attempts to counter its effects are futile. While this reality might be obvious that, the, um, especially with the current incorrigible president in office representing capitalism with a flair of a Las Vegas spectacle, this has been our condition for a while. It's, not, it's nothing new. Um, and it's very difficult to imagine a different world. Um, the theorist Mark Fisher, who actually passed away a few weeks ago, sadly enough, um, he's the author of the book Capitalist Realism. He describes this as a pervasive, this condition as a pervasive atmosphere, conditioning not only the production of culture, but also the regulation of work and education, and acting as a kind of invisible barrier constraining thought and action. We have all experienced this unbearable immateriality. This is our matrix. This is the world that we live in. This is our atmosphere. Mark Fisher also argues that the tiniest event can tear a hole in the gray curtain of reaction which has marked the horizons of possibility. From a situation in which nothing can happen, suddenly everything is possible again. All of the previously described mechanics of my work, representation, labor, economies, foreground what I hope to be a what I believe to be a subtle and unifying strategy of resistance. I want to make resistant things. I want my things to become strange. I want them to be anomalies, awkward objects with physical glitches that slow down and or create tensions or frictions within a specific site or economic system. Bumping and denting a trail that begins to outline a small pocket of resistance, a space of possibility. I'm going to talk, this is going to go rather quickly, um, and so I won't talk about all of these in, in depth, but I'll kind of just, this is a list of things that I've done. Over the course of the past 20 years, I've made a large number of sculptures that have been part of projects, um, part of untitled projects. Some of them have um, 
existed before they were untitled projects and some kind of exist on the periphery of them. Um, they include floor tiles from my graduate school studio, garage sales, mail order catalogs, pyramid scheme selling untitled product, and if you sell to other people who sell for you, then you can make money off of me and I'll make money off of you. Um, selling cups of Kool-Aid at art fairs for a quarter. Renting VHS tapes of the movie Slacker in Austin, Texas, where the film was made. Selling fall leaves for the price of bread and, bed and breakfast in Vermont. Gift cards. Mixed tape swaps. <laughs> free TVs. Free Bibles. Gifting Marcel Mauss's book, The Gift. Bartering for maple syrup in Vermont. Bartering for bartering paintings of barter items on Craigslist for other different things that I wanted on Craigslist. Selling Tupperware on eBay in their decorative arrangements. Selling paintings of eBay, of Eames chair auctions back onto eBay in the same category and price. Um, I sold my collector's copy of Ruscha's Nine Swimming Pools in order to sell paintings of the same auction. Um, so essentially I was able to sell it twice um, on eBay. Um, paintings of free plants from New York City Craigslist ads. Selling paintings of money in the form of Cyprea moneta. These are the earliest forms of money, um, these shells that are being sold on eBay. Selling carved and painted vintage Melmac on eBay. Paintings of images of Rolex watches with suburban backgrounds. Paintings of Austra Australian gold nuggets for sale on eBay auctions in Australia. Selling paintings of images of eBay postcard auctions of sellers based in Indiana featuring postcards from everywhere else. Selling paintings of images of vintage Vermont postcard auctions originating from a global seller in India. Selling paintings of images of eBay auctions of computers with camera flash on their screen. Um, oh, I'm missing one there. Um, selling paintings of images of Depression era glass eBay auctions to raise money for local food pantries during the 2008 economic downturn. Paintings of photographs of Indy 500 crash cars as depressing souvenirs. Uh, sending spam email with Karl Marx quotations to sell Rolex watches. So essentially, if you clicked on that piece of spam, then you could be sent to this online store and you could buy this fake watch for real. Um, a library, a paperback bookshop in Geneva, Switzerland. A record shop selling records from the 1960s. A record shop of 45s featuring songs about love or protest. Science fiction DVDs for a genomic biology center. Um, some of the scientists didn't approve of this rendering of their profession, but um, they didn't have a say. A subscription of vintage art form magazines from 1969 to 70 designed to arrive every month 40 years later with a then current issue of art forum. A book of the month club, a used book sale, self-help books for free with a caveat that they can only go to those who need self-help, a celebration of cats, framed paint by numbers, framed photographs of Babe Ruth with light reflections, books about capitalism face down on the floor, Design within reach catalog face down on the floor. American romantic naturalist text with lawn chairs. American romantic naturalist text with Eames rocking chairs. Large architecture books on designer tables. Books containing neoliberal ideas about creativity on designer tables. Graphic designer lifestyle books on designer tables. Vintage Playboy spread of mid-century modern designer men. Rocks and Art Forum magazine ads placed on designer tables. Centered Rocks and Art Forum magazine. 
contemporary art form advertisements of galleries selling 1960s conceptual artwork. Art form magazine featuring a diamond skull, Damien Hurst. Um, artwork in contemporary art museum, bookstore, shopping bags. Um, this is all carved and painted, uh, carved out of wood and painted too. So, um, critical philosophical text, the book Empire in Borders, books, shopping bags. Anti-capitalist DVDs, the movie The Corporation in video store shopping bags. Adam Smith's Wealth of the Nations, holding open a gallery door at 45 degrees. Indoor orange traffic cones, orange designer handbags, deflated beach balls, inflated whoopee cushions, conceptual art truism sold on hipster caps, table signs about table signs about touching, neon signs about paying attention, bank signs about paying attention, post-it notes about really paying attention, <laughs> post-it notes on walls pointing to flaws in the gallery. Roadside arrow signs with instructions for participating viewers. Clearance signs, sale banner signs, donation boxes, suggestion boxes, trash bins for galleries to keep empty, trash bins for gallery visitors to fill up, large orange dumpster as public space or stage for interactions. This is a student project collaboration, and it got tagged. <laughs> sculptures of products placed back on store shelves and left behind. Sculptures of things placed next to other things on the sidewalk in San Francisco, photographed and left behind. Sculptures, sculptures of debris placed in formal relationships to their context, photographed and left behind. Sculptures of Hot Wheels cars, Hot Wheel cars positioned, parked next to their real counterparts. Sculptures of Hot Wheel cars with patriotic backgrounds. Tables with post-reception food debris. Muted TVs, digital projectors, branded walls. Herman Miller Eames table sculptures carved and painted at one-to-one -one scale. Paintings of Eames tables from online auctions. Paintings of Bauhaus photographs, sculptures based upon Bauhaus photographs. Paintings of the of Marcel Brewer's Wassili chair from null promotional photographs priced according to the real chair. George Nelson clocks, Thousand Island dressing, potatoes, <laughs> and the greatest form of art, free beer. <laughs> so that should give you a sense of what I've been doing for the past 20 or so years. That sounds like such a big number when I say it, but um, yeah. Um, I'm going to go through some other projects now. Um, a little bit more in depth. If you have questions, again, let me know, or we can talk about it afterwards. Um, these projects aren't going, aren't presented chronologically. Rather, their ordering is intended to build a series of questions about things, economies, and strategies of resistance. Untitled project commute. it down a little bit. There's nothing really to hear besides there. Okay, I've talked about ways in which my simulated objects move through specific economies, bumping, denting trails as it becomes a thing. And this project does it literally. I constructed a Hot Wheels car based on a version, a Hot Wheels version of my own uh, Jetta station wagon and mounted it to my bicycle and videotaped my commute, tracing my path from my home to my work. Um, at the School of Art and Design at the University of Illinois, in a drive that normally takes about 10 minutes, or less than 10 minutes. I'm interested in the way that the project reveals the awkwardness of the illusion when my bike wobbles, when it kind of looks like a car, and when it doesn't. Um, when my stamina fades. Um, there's moments where it, you have to work hard to make it look like it's actually a car driving. Um, and of course, it's a loop video, so um, at the end of the first half, it goes to my office and then fades to black, and at the end of the day, um, I drive my car, or I bike my car back home again. Um, and it doesn't show the fact that I had to do this 
multiple times to get it right, um, which I don't do normally on my commute. Untitled Project Garage Sale, and this is one of the first um, economic projects that I engaged in after graduate school. Um, and this is in 1997, was, I was living in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I had a number of these objects that I was making for other purposes, other installations. And a, a show in a gallery kind of changed schedule. And I had these things accumulated. And I was thinking about these objects as if they were real. Um, this would be a moment where I would try and get rid of them, like real things that would accumulate in someone's garage or basement. Um, and I was interested in, I've always been interested in garage sales as a public space of private objects um, where we go and make judgments about our neighbors, about what they're getting rid of, um, or creating value based on what we know about an object's value or what its, valuable, what, what its value is to us. Um, so for one day, I held this garage sale of, these, of this, all of these objects. Um, reactions to the sale ranged from uh, confusion to laughter, seeing there was a moment of uh, the participants in the garage sale kind of seeing themselves um, seeing a garage sale in the sense that they would be drawn to some of the same objects that they might normally be drawn to in a garage sale, but of course there's always this, this pause because they're not real. Um, it was, so this project kind of engaged an economic option that I didn't even think about at the time, and I should have, um, but it wasn't part of my thinking it. And so when someone asked how much they were, I didn't have a really good answer. I, I was thinking, um, I don't know. Uh, and then I gave them a gallery price for these objects, which um, was still quite affordable for an artwork, but um, they were not affordable for a garage sale object. And so it kind of shut down the conversation. And so that was something that I took with me to the next project. Um, an untitled mail order catalog. This is a, a project that um, I received support from Creative Capital to produce. It started out as an extension of the garage sale, as a literal extension. I was thinking about a garage sale catalog, but then that made no sense. So um, I, in my catalog research, I realized that there's this whole category of objects um, of potential that will make your lives better, faster, easier, stronger. Um, the hammock or Schlemmer types of catalogs are sharper image. I think both of those companies are now out of business. Um, a lot of these objects are technologically advanced or they're innovative in some kind of way. Um, and for this project, I priced the objects. Um, I, I was thinking about the value a little bit more intentionally. Um, I selected objects from these various catalogs. I made them out of wood based on the photographs, um, kind of even copying some of their dimensional uh, um, perspective. Um, and then designed them into a catalog and priced them at the same price as their original. Because um, I was hoping to create like this again, this, this double take that extended not only in terms of what it looked like, but also what it, what its value was. Um, I was also interested in the way in which um, my doing this project became a way to slow down and uh, make strange this whole process of consumption. Um, so for someone to uh, buy an object from the catalog, they would call um, it would call the toll-free number. The toll-free number would go to my cell phone, and I would take their order. And most of the conversations were also, um, are you the one making the objects? Because that was a moment of strangeness, usually when you buy something or when people don't do this anymore, do they? They don't buy things through catalogs as much. Um, but there's a distance between the operator and the object and the consumer, and then the object comes from some other place. Um, so I would receive the calls. I would. Um, take the orders, they would send in their money, um, and I would get to work and I would make the objects to order. Um, um, some objects sold more than others. There was a potential for this to take over the rest of my life, but it did not. 
um, it kind of put a, a time frame on it so that it wouldn't um, become too consuming. Um, and there's also uh, the small print revealed that there's uh, 180 days um, delay between the ordering of the object and the receiving of the object. So um, it gave me time to um, make the work and then ship it and sell it to them. Um, There's something about putting my own um, availability um, into into this project, or my own inconveniencing of having to kind of follow through on these orders, being obligated to um, kind of complete these uh, these transactions. Um, that that I think is really important for, even though it's not necessarily part of the making of the piece, it's something that's that, and it's not about me as much as um, something is slowing down um, the reception or possibly uh, uh, accumulation of this object. Um, there's also the phenomenon of what happened afterwards. Um, and this is something that I don't solicit. I don't ask information about you know, where these objects go um, for this project and most of the projects. Um, but, but I do get unsolicited um, stories about what they, uh, what people have done, participants have done with their object. And in this case, the nose hair trimmer was sold to someone in Florida. Um, they and their family initially put it on a pedestal in their living room, but it looked wrong. And then so they all decided as a family to put it in the guest family or the guest bathroom medicine cabinet as sort of like a, it's both like a resting place um, for it, but also uh, it could be mistaken. Um, and I, I was interested in that, them taking on the responsibility for the problems of this thing, um, the thing that doesn't work, but also like how do they then define it and how their def definition um, plays into the piece. Untitled Project Consumer Actions. This is from 2002. A series of interventions where I produced sculptural objects, copies of specific consumer goods, and placed them back in the shelves of the originating store. So I'd go to the store, buy some things, and then make copies of them, and then go back into the store and very carefully put the object I made back onto the shelf, or onto the shelf, and I would photograph it, and then I would leave. Um, I was interested in how, the sp again, space and objects um, were connected, um, especially in terms of commodities. I wanted to slow down the consumer object, make it strange, and put the space of consumption in question, and draw attention to the way that um, consumer goods interact with consumers. And also, not staying to watch what happens was also in a very intentional way of not getting in the way of the object or whatever the the sculpture of the object doing what it needed to be to do. So I don't know where these went. Um, I, I imagine uh, they have, they kind of evoke an imagined possible range of responses from being thrown away or uh, um, taken out of the store because they're not really for sale anyway, or maybe they are on the lunch table in the back of Menards um, or wherever they came from. Um, but the idea of where they exist um, was less important to me than trying to capture the moment or the imagined dilemma of what happens when you encounter this artifice in, this, in, in the, in the um, pacing of an everyday today experience. Um, I produced this project in a, kind of experimenting with different stores. I found out that Target was much more policed than Kmart. Um, um, and some things are harder to carry into the store than others. Um, I produced a whole series of these for Kmart of round, of circular objects in square packaging as kind of a, a formal um, categorizing device.
Uh, and I also produced a couple of these for thrift stores, um, which became strange in the sense that there are a lot of really weird objects in thrift stores already. And so mine became one of those strange objects. Um, um, so these are uh, objects with love put back into thrift stores. Um, and um, what's interesting is that I did find out what happened to one of these objects because I was living in an apartment building um, where my downstairs neighbor actually purchased a salt and pepper shaker that I had made and put into the thrift store. And they had no idea what it was. Someone told them that it was a sculpture of mine. And they're like, oh. <laughs> so there you go. OK. Untitled Project Market Geneva. This is part of a group exhibition called Project Placement for a gallery called Al Gallery Analytics Forever um, in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, for this show, there's a number of artists that were brought in to produce um, site-specific projects around the city. I was interested in the history of Geneva as a site for the origins of the Protestant Reformation, but also a site for the history of timekeeping, um, the watch industry specifically. Two significant cultural conditions that prioritize the individual and lay the groundwork for what we know as advanced capitalism, the monetization of our time, um, but also our, the freedom of the individual when we control our own time. Just down the street from the gallery was a public space, um, kind of a plaza called uh, the Plain de Palais, which hosted an open air flea market twice a week, um, and where there was the selling of pretty much everything from antiques to um, uh, bootleg DVDs to food to Rolex watches. On the day before the opening of the exhibition, I set up a table in the in the plane to play and sold carved and painted fake Rolex watches at the going rate of cheap Rolex replicas. So these are 20 francs a piece. Um, and I also sold copies of uh, Marx's Capital Volume 1 and Max Weber's The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism for the same amount, also 20 francs. Um, I spent the afternoon uh, not speaking French to people who asked me questions in French. Um, <laughs> And there became, sometimes there would be a translation of someone else who was nearby, or I'd try and explain the really rudimentary um, gestures about that these are for sale. Um, no, they're not real, obviously. Um, I also gave, made uh, copies of my Swiss army knife that I gave to passersby that engaged me in conversation about the project. So I was thinking about these, that as a souvenir of our shared experience by giving them my Swiss Army watt, uh, knife that was a sculpture. Um, There's a couple of watch buyers, sellers that were um, disgusted with my uh, practice. Um, but for the most part, it created a lot of interesting questions about um, what they were. Um, the fact that they were indeed for sale um, and why the question of why someone would buy it and of course people did. The next day the, uh, the table along with the watches and the books shifted back into the shifted into the gallery exhibition space where the price was set at the gallery sculpture rate as a single work um, along with photographs of the market event. I was interested in this sudden arbitrary shift of value, how the context of one space or the other determine value and accessibility. Um, a number of projects, I've used eBay, early on I used eBay quite a bit because it was a really fascinating site for, um, for looking at what people were what objects values were. Um, There's a lot of weird things on eBay and people didn't have all the apps and um, programming that they have now. So a lot of it's so automated and everyone knows what the real value of these things are now because they've been bought and sold in these online spaces so often. Information is there. 
Um, but at first it was a, a little bit more of a free-for-all and it was really an interesting space for thinking about objects, not only objects as they were, but also how objects were represented, how objects were photographed, um, reflections of owners in objects even. So in 2003, a series of, I made a series of Tupperware measuring cup sculptures based on Tupperware um, arrangement patterns on eBay. And this is for an exhibition at the Tang Museum in upstate New York. I was inter interested in these as objects from the 1960s, as serial objects, thinking about series and seriality that came out of uh, minimalism in the 60s. Um, I was also interested in how these objects at the time came out of a marginal economy, Tupperware parties, where they're primarily organized by, um, in domestic spaces by housewives. Um, they were even advertised in this way and provided, providing them with pocket money or autonomy, um, which I thought was interesting in the same kind of way in which eBay might have been doing that in the early 2000s, of you know, creating a little space of freedom through income um, by people who are trapped in one condition or another. Um, and so I was kind of replicating this, look, looking at the second life of these objects um, through eBay um, and how they were being bought and sold. And also realized that um, the buyers and sellers of Tupperware measuring cups, um, they put them in these really beautiful, you know, this is the fan display, this is, I don't know, the prey display, I don't know if it's really the name of it. Um, Oftentimes, these are for aesthetic reasons. If you make your objects interesting looking, then they're more likely to sell. But there's also trickery involved because if you have five objects and, you, um, and you're supposed to have six Tupperware to make the complete measuring cup set, if you arrange them really interestingly, um, you might disguise the fact that you don't have the complete set. So the, thinking about the way that the aesthetic um, came into play both for acts of consumption um, but also acts of um, attraction and um, confusion. Uh, another eBay project, also in 2003, I made paintings of Eames shell chairs based on eBay auction images. So this is where I, I took images from eBay auctions and um, at the same scale that they would be printed out at on my computer, which back then also was very small. Uh, I made a small painting of these chairs. Um, and each painting was titled and priced according to its original auction and then put back onto eBay in the same category for a series of 3D auctions. Um, I also did that with eBay Tupperware measuring cups too, I didn't mention that. Um, like putting them back into eBay at starting at the same price um, was an important part of that project. Um, this project has a lot more art history involved in that. I was thinking about Hans Hoffman. Um, Hans Hoffman, of course, if you know, is the famous for the push-pull of color in space. Ray Eames, Charles Eames' partner, wife, um, was a student of Hans Hoffman. And you can see the pushing and pull of color in space that happens. Um, she was the main, um, she was the better formalist than Charles Eames and was very interested in the way in which color occupied space. So you, you look at these chairs in space, they become floating blocks of color. Um, and I was watching how that would happen, that pushing and pulling of color of space would happen on eBay as well. Um, and eBay has a whole history of telling their sellers about how to make their images better, what images sell better, um, uh, um, and I'm, I'm sure it's changed over, over the years, but uh, having a striking image or having something, something colorful against a neutral background was one way in which they talked about uh, promoting your objects or selling your objects better. Um, so I, I was thinking again about pushing these objects from their one history into this other space um, as a way of um, Double, making them kind of do what they did already, but as an image instead of an object. Um, they all sold within the general value range of a real um, 
Herman Miller Eames shell chairs. Uh, some of the sellers of these chairs contacted me at, um, at different points. Um, one gave me more narrative information that, that I could put into my auction to help sell it. Um, and I think this is the one where he said that I photographed this chair in, um, in the Empire State Building if you want to use that to sell your painting of the chair. So it's kind of, yeah. Um, eBay Rouché, this is the uh, Nine Swimming Pools book that I sold on eBay and then made paintings of my own auction and then sold the book again on to eBay um, at this kind of selling going rate. Um, I was much more in control of my aesthetic, of course, in this, in this part of the project where I was thinking about, I was modeling how these, uh, these objects were being sold, um, but also very interested in making a set of paintings um, that followed these, um, the, the tropes of, of eBay, the way that um, Ed Ruscha's books follow the tropes of different kinds of photography. More recent project um, using eBay, um, untitled project eBay Ding, um, started in 2008, still ongoing. A series of paintings based on eBay auction images of mid-century modern furniture. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm picking one image from the auction that reveals the flaw, the ding, the scratch. Um, thinking about like, these are like good faith images where um, honest sellers will point out um, the part of the object that's wrong or that um, as a way of kind of revealing that it's real um, or that they're being honest with you. Um, each painting was titled according to the original and priced according to the final sales value, but they were not placed back on eBay. Um, and I was interested in how these dings are both truthful moments of, um, they're not, these moments where the furniture was no longer pure um, but there are also moments where the furniture became more real. These are the moments where the object literally um, interacted with its owners in some kind of way and created a certain history, a narrative. And I like how these scratches, these dents, these dings are part of the object's history and the narrative of their use. Um, of course, with these paintings, there's also this John Baldessari moment of thinking about um, um, uh, it, these, his instruction paintings of, of people pointing to things um, and how like there's a, a relationship to um, the finger to scale, the finger to identification. Sometimes it's just whatever's in the mid, very middle of the photograph um, or there's other objects um, or designations of um, digital des designations of where the, the um, dent or scratch is, or <laughs> literally. Untitled Project Commodity Capital, and this is in 2007 for a group exhibition called The Irresistible Force at the Tate Modern. I was interested in Karl Marx's text. I've been interested in this text for a while because it's a hugely influential text. It's also a text that everyone knows about, but no one's really read. Um, it's very descriptive, um, more than it is scientific. Um, and it, its descriptions, I mean, I like it for its both its impenetrability, but also the fact that it, it exists in culture almost um, outside of itself. Um, and the penguin Classics version of this, of course, is uh, produced out of England, out of London. If you were to purchase this book, um, at the time when I was doing my research about this project, um, if you were to purchase this peng paperback penguin from uh, the London store, it would cost about 25 pounds to have it shipped to me where I was living. So I produced a sculpture of this book and exhibited a, a sales flyer order form for um, copies of this book. Um, 
and place these flyers in the limited number of exhibition catalogs. So there's a, there's a, a limit, uh, kind of an addition of catalogs that were part of a project, that were part of the show. And so I included these flyers into, into those catalogs. And if someone would fill out this form and send me 25 pounds um, in cash through the mail, through international mail, then I would, um, after 180 days, I would complete the order and send them a carved and painted copy of Capital Volume 1. Um, there was, uh, I think, just, just over 30 of these orders were, um, I received 30 orders and filled them all. Some of these projects do not generate a return. Um, in fact, some of them generate more work for me than I realize. Um, this is also an intentional part of thinking about what I do as um, putting myself, making myself vulnerable to the project, but also to the buyers. Um, so in the exhibition, it was um, presented with the, um, in the space, the, a copy of the book, um, but then it was, you would, uh, I would receive in the mail um, the order forms with money, and then I would send back copies of Capital Volume 1 and receive occasionally uh, unsolicited uh, photographs of where they put them. I talked about this briefly in the list of projects. Untitled Project Replica Spam, um, also dealing with uh, Marx's Capital Volume 1. Um, and I was really in, interested and inspired by the daily email spam that I was receiving back then. This is 2007, so this is 10 years ago. But um, and spam still exists, but it's gotten a lot more sophisticated. Back then it was a little bit more, it was strained and rudimentary. It's like there was an image and then there was text, but the text was just clipped from somewhere else. Um, and sometimes you could, if you search the text, you could figure out that it was from some online literature or um, another website, but it was just made to look like content. So I took um, this format and um, created these, um, Kind of the, again, like the, the back company that would, was making the product um, that the spam was linking to, uh, these boxes of uh, featuring Rolex watches. Um, so if you clicked on this spam, you would be drawn to an online store. This is the only way to get to the store is through the spam. So um, you couldn't access the, the objects or get access to the objects in any, any other way. Um, but the spam also has... Um, um, almost like a meditations from Marx's Capital Volume 1 as thinking about like how the content might still somehow be absorbed by um, in the spam um, interaction with them. Um, Untitled Project Muscle Car. This is a 1969 Pontiac GTO, The Judge. Um, I'm not a muscle car fanatic, um, but my work does take me into specific audiences and communities. Um, and really, like if I were to be honest, one of the main motivations for this sculpture was I wanted to make a large orange thing. Um, and so I started doing research, and I had this exhibition space lined up. Um, this is a, a space called Suitable in Chicago, and the space was literally in a garage in someone's backyard in a neighborhood. So I was thinking about the garage, I was thinking about like doing one object for the space and I was interested in color orange. Um, so in my research I came into contact with muscle cars and thinking about the 60s especially in 1969 was kind of the peak of the muscle car um, era. Um, after 69 the, the cars, the engines got smaller, more economic um, and uh, less power. Uh, this car is, um, it's, it's also three quarters of a scale of the real thing. So it's not full scale, but it, it looks like it is up until you get close to it. So there's a nice kind of diminut diminutive um, experience of as you approach it, it gets smaller. So kind of like the shrinking of masculinity perhaps. Uh, the 
the project and the show were um, advertised in the Chicago Sun-Times classifieds in the custom modified classified section. Um, the price of the car was, and also in Deals and Wheels online and in the magazine, the price was based on the, car, the price of uh, the Jetta station wagon that I had purchased for myself, thinking that I could sell the car and then pay for this other car. Um, but it didn't sell for that price. Um, the thinking about this object as both an object of nostalgia, of longing, both longing for um, the way in which nostalgia functions as longing for something that really didn't exist, um, the power that this car sort of embodies. Um, I was interested in, in kind of complicating that, some kind of accessing the, um, the attraction or the interest in these kinds of objects by a certain group of constituents, um, but also then kind of making it more complicated. Um, there's a moment during the, the first exhibition, this is in the second or third place where it was shown, but in the first exhibition there was a neighborhood car club that actually came to see the show on the last day. And I was in the space talking with another um, a friend who was a curator, and we were talking about the, the object um, as a sculpture, and then this group of other enthusiasts came in and were talking about it as um, a car sculpture. Um, and there's a really interesting relationship of um, how the relationship to this object was similar, but also um, part of the approach was shifted depending on um, their orientation to, or their, the language of their discourse. Um, um, it did go on to eBay eventually, and there was um, some interesting relations, um, experiences I had with someone who wanted to buy this because they collect GTO judges, and he knew exactly what it was, and he was saying how um, he wanted to build another room off of his garage for this, because um, he understood it as a sculpture, but um, that it had to be separate from his real GTO judge. Um, it didn't end up being sold to him, um, but I was really fascinated by, again, by these exchanges with like, how they were negotiating, dealing with this object that was not real. Um, back issues, Untitled Project back issues. Um, um, a series of sculptures of magazines um, based on specific back issues. And these are popular magazines or art magazines from the 1960s. And I was interested in, in the dates of these publications and how um, making the same date as uh, very specific public protests or race riots, thinking about the relationship and the distance between the domestic spaces um, of what would be white upper middle class readership and the harsh realities and urgent politics of urban life. Um, so this piece is called um, Art Forum, Summer, 1969. The second part of the title is Stonewall Riots, New York City, June 28, 1969. So at the same time where the, when this magazine would be received in the mail uh, was when that riot happened. So I was thinking about trying to push both of these um, spaces and events into the same object. Um, I talked a little bit about the subscription project. I'll go move through it fast. Um, and I'll skip that one too. Um, seasonal economies. I did a series of projects for um, the Art Center in Burlington, Vermont, a few years ago um, under the heading of seasonal economies, thinking about Vermont as really great example of how they don't have much to sell there. So what they do is they sell the seasons, um, both from fall, winter. Spring is harder to sell because it's more mud than anything. Um, but they're, the way that they use the seasons to create these packages of experience, so going up to Vermont to watch the fall colors change, uh, or leaf peeping is what they how they call it, um, 
it's a thing, it's, and it's something that lots of people do. Um, leaves change color all over the northern hemisphere, um, but Vermont has a, a handle on um, their colors must be better. Um, I was also interested in the way in which Vermont has th this uh, very conscious liberal um, ethic of not wanting um, it's, a, it's a very complicated consumer space in Vermont because they, 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 want, they don't want capitalism to, be, to change everything that's part of Vermont, but also the way that they um, sell themselves engages many of the same phenomenon and strategies of capitalism. So um, I was keying into the way in which they've, they were trying to reject Dollar General stores. Dollar General stores kind of, they're not Walmart. Walmart is larger, so they can't just um, fit into the existing architecture, but Dollar General stores can. And so Vermont was fighting them because they didn't want Dollar General stores to take over their quaint shops in all these downtown spaces in small towns in Vermont. So, um, and this is a map of, um, if you are in Vermont in the fall, then you can um, go online and find out exactly where um, the leaves are at their best. And it's never really explained anywhere what that means. Um, if it's like a certain number of reds and oranges and yellows, or if green is part of that too, um, it's very, very arbitrary. Um, so what I did for the show is I made um, a dollar store sign. This is inside the exhibition space. And at, over the course of the exhibition, um, based on the maps that I, I just showed you, I would be following those maps and then I would send a new color chart to the gallery and they would paint um, uh, the letters of the dollar store sign um, according to the leaf map. So you'd know exactly when the peak of the leaf peeping season was happening. Um, and it moves from the inside of the state out because of where the mountains are. So like in, the, in the mountains, the higher altitudes, it turns sooner. Um, and so by, over the course of the show, this would be changing. Um, it was a very manual process um, where they had, uh, a student intern would get on a ladder and paint different letters, different colors, depending on what I would send to them. At the end of the show, they all became uh, orange-brown. And the plan was for it to turn white, but it didn't snow in time. So, Also during the course of the show, um, I would be making the Dollar General Savings circulars, these um, advertisements. Um, and I, what would happen is um, I tried to keep them current. So as the, the newest one would come out, I'd run to Dollar General and then bring it home and make a sculpture and paint it and then send it to the gallery space so that they could put it on display so that it would be current. Thinking about trying to make painting be timely in a literal way. Um, uh, I'm showing this project a little bit more to talk about the next project. So this is called Untitled Project Produce, How to Grow a Tomato. Um, where over the course of a summer, I grew a tomato plant I grow tomatoes in my small garden, in my yard. Um, and then I also made a sculpture of a tomato plant, thinking about them growing and developing at the same time. Um, kind of as a ritualistic activity, but also as a leisure activity, the way that art is. Um, but I use it to preface this project, Honda CB77 Superhawk. This is from 2013, 14. Um, and it's a carbon painted motorcycle, and it's based on the motorcycle from Zen and the Mo Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, um, which is a very, uh, it's somewhat autobiographical. Um, it's not a great book, but it's a, a highly popular book. Um, um, it's a lot about a guy talking about himself, and, and he's rather egocentric, um, and he um, is not very nice to his son. But he talks a lot about motorcycles and maintenance. I was interested in the way in which um, motorcycles and became a metaphor for other things in this process of the book. Um, and the idea that it, the motorcycle you're maintaining is yourself is kind of like the um, cheesy 
sort of message, I guess it would be. That was a really bad description of that book, but I'll, I'll go on. So I, was, I wanted to replicate what it would be like um, to make um, or refurbish a motorcycle um, by making it out of wood. Um, and so this is a project where the process was very much part of the work and, and where I didn't know if I could make it, first of all. I didn't know if it was possible for me to make it with my level of, of skill or if the wood would work. Um, um, I also didn't have an actual motorcycle. I've never ridden a motorcycle, really. Um, but I was interested in this as an object. And so I made a big printout, one-to-one -one scale of the motorcycle, and then using a bunch of images from online, from various angles, I would figure out what these parts were, according to me, um, and kind of build them into the motorcycle. So piece by piece, it gradually came into, um, into this form of the motorcycle. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about the errors that are involved in, in these sculptures as being part of the work. Um, and this is one case where the errors are, are um, there's a lot of inaccuracies in this. It's not, um, the details are there, but it also falls apart pretty quickly. Um, and that's an important part of this, where I don't want it to go that far. I'm interested in it kind of functioning as a vehicle to get me to that other place, metaphorically. Um, Walden was actually the one book he took with him on the trip. Um, in conjunction with this piece, I also made paintings of the same motorcycle, but in individual parts that were being sold on eBay. So the, this is the, also the motorcycle, but piece by piece, as you would buy it if you were to buy it and build it based on parts that are available online. Um, again, thinking about parts versus whole um, and the relationship between making the hand and um, objects. And this is for an exhibition in France, actually, um, on, this, on motorcycles. So. Um, I have a few more projects. Uh, Untitled Project, Anything You Want. This is an ongoing project where um, um, kind of trying to take advantage of the way that commissions work for artists and art buyers or collectors or even friends. Um, whereas if you know the artist and you generally tell them what you want when you want to trade or buy something, there's more of a, a specificity involved. Um, it, it also came out of um, the ongoing list of suggestions that I would be receiving um, from my kids or f people who would encounter my work. They would say, you should make this. And so I did. Um, I kind of incorporate that into the project. Um, essentially, it's a, it's a format for me to make a singular object for one person based on a negotiation. So trying to take down the, um, the apparatus of the object and the viewer and, and turn it into this transaction. So like in this case, um, someone had a pink pig eraser that they lost um, off of a ferry on the way to Connecticut and, and they couldn't find an image of it, so they kind of described it to me, and I made it, and we kind of came to an agreement that this is maybe what it looked like. Um, so, like for the thing that they can't get back, um, my fake version of that thing becomes a placeholder for both that thing that they lost, but also the fact that they can't have it. Um, uh, an art collector in New York wants to own this object by Jeff Koons, but there's only three available and they all are owned by museums. So it is the one thing that he wants that he can't have. So he had me make um, his own version of this sculpture by Jeff Koons, Rabbit. Um, it is three quarters scale or two thirds scale, so it's not quite as tall as the real, but, um, and it's made out of wood. Uh, the greatest Michael Jordan poster of all time, apparently. Um, 
Someone had a Miles Davis record that they received from their mother. Um, but then um, after she passed away, so they received this, this object that they kind of kept and it was really valuable for that reason. But then they bought another copy of that record and then they forgot which one was which. So I took both records and scanned them and made all of the marks on both of them onto one object. So it kind of embodies both of them, so it has to be right somewhere. Um, uh, Self-winding watch, a Swiss Army knife that was taken away by TSA, because they do. Um, magic lamp ring, a Polaroid of shot by an inmate while well, a family was visiting my father in Nevada State Prison. So um, this person had these Polaroid, didn't know what to do with them. And so my project became one way in which he figured out what to do with them um, as, as a way of thinking about like, what, the, what do these objects mean. So I made um, sculptural versions of these Polaroids. Um, uh, some cigarettes, or a cigarette, the first X-Men comic, or uh, Gita Board's um, um, directive painting. This is the one that was destroyed in a fire. Um, so it doesn't exist anymore except in one photograph um, and in this fake version of it. Um, I'll skip through this one to talk about last projects. I'll talk about this one and then the library and then I'll be done. Um, Untitled Project Still Life Style Leaf. This is based on an essay by George Preck where he describes the things on his desk. Um, and then that's the first part of the essay. And then the second part of the essay, he describes his description of the things on his desk. So it, if you're reading it, it sounds like he's saying the same exact things. Um, but he's not. There's subtle moments where he's changing the words or the phrase or he's changing the description or um, you get it a sense that it's, it's a deja vu, but it's different. Um, so this is essentially two of the same still lives that are echoing each other. So they're the same still life, but in two different forms um, across the room from each other in a gallery space in Chicago. And I was interested in how these objects that have been accumulating, these are objects that exist in my studio or my home. Um, and so I'd be making them and thinking about their equivalents and how equivalency could be literal, so like the, the uh, soccer ball Roscoe postcard or rubber bands were fairly identical, but then there's different editions of books or same editions of books. So creating this dialogue between one, um, one set of objects and another um, as a way of dealing with this, maybe it's a notion of repetition, Repetition not towards the same, but towards difference. Um, Joya, actually, it's a, it's a Bonnie Prince Billy poster that I've, I've had forever. I didn't realize until after I made this mineral poster that um, Joya means jewel in, in Spanish. So it kind of existed in this, in, even though I, I, was, I thought I was stretching it, um, but it made sense. I also produced this project um, in another, another space um, but on opposite sides of the same museum wall. So it, it occupied more of a memory space of um, where someone would encounter this box of, of things that would then be repeated um, on the other side of the wall. And so going back and forth to see what was same or what was different. Um, Last summer, I produced a, made a copy of Henry David Thoreau's Cabin. This is a, a photoshopped image of what I proposed. Um, and I built it on site as part of um, uh, a biennial of public works that were all outside on this coastal part of, of southern France. Um, I was I'm fascinated by this object because of what it represents, the fact that when you go to visit Walton Pond, you encounter the replica of the cabin, not the real thing. Um, so it was already a distance. So this is my replica of the replica. Um, it is not something that you can actually go inside. So it's a, it 
it's one of those frustrating objects. You can go up to the door, the door is open ajar, but um, you can't see, you can't go inside. Um, and it kind of exists to be um, an object to, th to put on, uh, that the viewer might kind of throw projections onto um, or desires onto in terms of what they want it to be. There's also this really dislocated relationship of this object being in France as opposed to on Walton Pond and how, like, I was interested in that, that disconnect as well. Um, the, the exhibition, I'm showing these are the projects that are in the exhibition. I thought I'd just end with these as a way of to preface um, the reception and, and the work that's actually there that you can see. Um, untitled project Crystal Land is based on an essay that Robert Smithson wrote in Harper's Bazaar um, in 1966, I think. Um, and it's really a, an essay where he's describing him and his wife, Nancy Holt, and Donald Judd and Donald Judd's wife um, going out from New York City to these quarries in uh, New Jersey. They go out for ice cream. They look at some housing developments. They find some rocks and um, then they go back home. It's, there's nothing really going on in this essay. Um, it's not critical writing, but it's one of my favorite es theoretical essays to assign uh, for my grad students because of that. Um, in the very beginning of this essay, he, he just borrows, pulls a list of um, rocks from a New Jersey rock hunting guide. Um, just a list of minerals that by the time you get to the middle, you realize that it doesn't even sound like English anymore. It's just all the scientific names for these minerals that um, exist in the area. So for this project, I, um, I took each one of those mineral names. There's about 60 of them total, so about 30 total um, completed so far. And I'd find these minerals on eBay and, um, and specifically finding um, these minerals on eBay being held by their seller. So that the way in which the hand becomes a way to generate scale, but also talk about connection of human to rock. And also um, an important part of this project is the title of each one, how the title reveals where the rocks are coming from, where the minerals are coming from um, all over the world. Thinking again about site, um, the specificity of site, but also the non-site relationship of um, that happens in the buying and selling of rocks. Um, and these are presented like they're, as if they were like photographs based on the size that the final eBay images um, were scaled to be. So eBay images have gotten larger over the years um, and more detailed. Um, and you'll see them in the space. Also, the, uh, the red wheelbarrow, which is um, also a, a nod to William Carl Carlos Williams, the poet who happened to be Robert Smithson's uh, pediatric doctor, which I think is an amazing thing to think about. Um, and now the library, Robert Smithson's library and book club. Um, Robert Smithson's library right now, um, they, they put it together or they kind of uh, archived it after he died in 1973. Um, in a plane crash. So he died prematurely um, and they thought his library was important enough as part of him or his work to save. And so I think it was probably an art history graduate student um, kind of itemized it, figured out what the editions were of each of these books and then they put them in boxes and they're now in the archives of American art in Washington DC in the Smithsonian. Um, and you can go and look at them apparently um, you can go and, if you're a researcher, you can say, I want this box that has these items in. You can kind of go through each box one by one. Um, but other than that, it's largely inaccessible. And I was, I've seen this list of books printed at least uh, two, maybe three times in various Robert Smithson periodicals or texts or monographs. And I was, I'm, I was interested in how the library became absorbed into this thing that was Robert Smithson. Um, and how books do that. The books that we collect say something about us. Um, 
there's also this nice bracketing moment where I've always been interested in these objects and moments from the 1960s and early 70s and Robert Smithson dying in 73. Um, his collection of books ended there. So there's this nice moment of this, these are all the books that he owned. Um, and so it becomes um, as much about the 1960s, um, um, the ideas of the 60s appear in the collection of these books and the titles. Um, there's also um, this project, like a lot of my other projects too, this sense of coming out of a loss. Um, painting is a technology that um, is fairly old. Um, and I was interested in how old technologies might do something or in the representation of newer technologies. The way that books are changing, our relationship to books is, has changed over the, as they've become digitized. Um, I'm interested in how that loss of the object creates either, has it created more coffee table books that are more physical, or has it also um, created more of a, of a different kind of library that we collect that's more symbolic than functional. Um, paperback books especially were, uh, I'm interested in how they um, function like the early internet, sharing of ideas. Um, they're very portable, um, they're inexpensive and they could be, if, if you read a great paperback about this topic, you could give it to a friend and they would give it to a friend and so on. So like this idea of sharing knowledge or accessing information um, was different then than it is now. Um, the library is a longer project than I realized when I first started. Um, it's not finished yet. Uh, there's 1,100 books, I think, total. Um, and I'm about halfway through. Um, so, I mean, my, one of my main motivations was because I wanted to visit the library of Robert Smithson. That doesn't exist. So this becomes, in a way, a, a surrogate library that someone can um, engage with. Um, and it's in the next building down the street. Um, I believe this is the last. Oh, I should talk about the book club. Um, the second part of this project, the first part is the primary archive of I'm making every book in his library and it'll become one piece. Um, but also to make it um, accessible so that um, people can buy shares in it, so to speak. Uh, there's a book club portion where for a small amount you can um, reserve a title if it's not already reserved and I'll make one additional book for every book that's in his library um, and I can, I'll make that for people who want to become part of this book club. And so this book club has become, um, I think of it as a distributed archive of, of where there's the main um, archive of, of books representing the library, but then these other books and titles that are existing all around the world, um, owned by different people for different reasons, and how that also functions as a relationship, as a non-site relationship to uh, the site of the actual library. Um, this is the third time I've shown the library, and it's expanded every time. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs>